I have total 80s flashbacks when I see that. Those of you that, uh, that VHS, you pop that little VHS thing, and then if your tape gets messed up, or those of you that are under 40 have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, hey, um, if you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to Psalm 119. We're continuing on with our series um, uh, from last year. We did the first half of Psalm 119. I want to encourage you, if you want to listen to the first part, but there's a natural break in Psalm 119, and so we're picking it up as we go through November. We're going to be looking at Psalm 119, Walking in the Word. Um, I think it's an appropriate passage of Scripture um, with Tuesday coming, and um, I'm excited about... um, what the Scripture is going to teach us this morning. Um, I know that it has taught me a ton as I've prepared um, what's going on. Psalm 119, starting with verse 73, we're going to read all the way to verse 88. If you don't own a Bible or don't have a Bible, there's one under the seat in front of you. If you don't own it, take it home with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. Psalm 119, beginning with verse 73, your hands have have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my, heart, may, may my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. Verse 81, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have also made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Verse verse 88, in your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep your testimonies of your mouth. Let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's truth. We thank you that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord God, that in the hands of your Holy Spirit, it divides between the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow, Lord God. It's a sharp, powerful, double-edged sword. We pray, Lord God, that we would not be hearers of your word only, but we'd be doers of your word. We pray, Lord God, that this word would so penetrate our lives, that your word would penetrate our lives that all would know that your Son, Jesus Christ, is our Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you would teach us your word this morning. Lord, we thank you that it is truth. And that you you, will use it in our life to sanctify us. Because your word is truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by you. Lord God, thank you for being truth. And as always, Lord God, let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
It's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Psalm 119, we're picking up in verse 73. I want to give you some background to Psalm 119 for those of you that are here that maybe weren't here last year in November. By means of introduction, there's 176 verses in Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It was written by King David. Most tradition says that it was written for his son Solomon. Each section gives a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 stanzas, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there's one letter and eat for each section. And the purpose in which David wrote this was to celebrate God's Word. It was written for Rosh Hashanah, or the Jewish New Year. And in celebrating God's Word, all through Psalm 119, you see that it's David interacting and trying to teach his son how to interact with the Word of God and how the Word of God interacts with his life. And how that we just don't read it as a textbook, but we allow it to penetrate us so that our life would be different. And so in Psalm 119, if you, if you go back to Psalm 119, verse 72, the verse before we started the reading, one of the verses that kind of discusses it or encapsulates it, as David is writing, he says, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So he's, he, he's communicating. Parents, teach your children the Word of God. It's better than an education at Harvard or Yale or Princeton or any other place. That's pretty obvious. When you know the Word of God, it will change you, make you wise, make you everything that God has created you to be. It will conform you into the image of Christ. And so, to understand this, we need to understand that it is not that we master the Word of God, but that the Word of God masters us. So that's really my prayers. We're going to address this. And, and David, in these two sections, in these two letters, he deals with the question, does God really care? Does God really care? We see in verse 73 that your hands have made and fashioned me. So there's a God that made us. And now the question that David goes and deals with in the next two sections is, but does he care about us? Does he care? And how does the Word of God apply? So by means of introduction, I, I want to kind of give you some thoughts God not only cares, but wants us to cast our cares on Him. 1 Peter 5, 7. The Apostle Peter's writing, and if anybody could write about anxiety, I think it would be the Apostle Peter. He says this in 1 Peter 5, 7. It's going to come up on the screen at some point. I'm just waiting. There it is. Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. It's interesting. The devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour there in 1 Peter chapter 5. But then it says, cast all your cares upon Him for He cares for you or your anxieties. See, it's the devil's job to isolate us in our sin. It's the devil's job to isolate us. We really think we're very, very special and unique when we have our own struggles. And so what we do is we're very, very quiet about them and we don't really share about them. But the reality is we're not that special. And, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, I know. You've been raised thinking that you're special. You're special in the sense that God has made you unique and there's no one else like you. 
but you're not that special in the sense of the things that happen to you in this life. And if I went through some statistics and stuff, you would realize that we're all going through the same stuff. That all of us experience one way or the other. And in fact, as we go through this life and the difficulties of life that hit us, we realize that sometimes we're thinking that we're the only one that's suffering. Or we're the only one that is, that is being attacked. Or we're the only one. We tend to isolate ourselves. But the reality is the Word of God tells us something different and recognize that you are not alone. And I'm not just saying God is with you. I'm also saying, and not, not only that God cares for you, but I'm also saying this, that we have shared experiences and we have more in common than we do apart. And so by means of introduction, I, I want to kind of give you a few verses to demonstrate that God does care for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than the birds? Matthew 6, 26. Luke chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Mine are getting less, it's subtraction, but God can do that. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Psalm 139, turn over there if, you, if you'd like. Think about how God cares for us. Verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, David writes, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. God not only cares for us, but he wants us to cast our cares upon him or our anxieties. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He knows you. In Psalm 119.73, your hands have made and fashioned me, and he still loves you, warts and all. Think about this, parents. How much do you love for your do you love your children? Or people that don't have children, how much do you have? Do you have someone that you love? What would you do for them? I think about my children. There's nothing I wouldn't do for my children. There's nothing. My son, a week and a half ago, broke his nose. He had surgery Friday, last Friday. It was nasty, lots of blood. And I'm holding him. I'm just loving on him. I wanted that to be me, not him. Why? Because I absolutely love this child. And we'll look at what God says about us and how this relates to the Word of God. Does God really care? There's two ways that we know that God cares from each section. And if you're taking notes from the bulletin, write these down. The first one is that God is faithful in our affliction. God is faithful in our affliction. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says that every morning, God's faithfulness is great. Great is your faithfulness, Jeremiah says. Every morning, your mercies are new. And this is important for us to understand and see because God is faithful in our affliction means this, that He doesn't take it away. He's just faithful with us. He is with us in our affliction. Look at what David is writing. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Now, it's interesting to say, by means, for you to understand, every time you're reading Psalm 119, 
Every time he word, uses the word law, he's talking about the word of God. Give me understanding of my Lord, your commandments. He's talking about the word of God. Because I have hoped in your word, verse 74. I know, O oh Lord, that your rules, he's talking about the word of God. Verse 76, in your steadfast love according to your promise. Let's talk about the word of God again. All these words are synonymous. Let your mercy come to me that I may live for your law. Talking of the word of God. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood for I will meditate on your precepts. There's another, there's another word there. He's using these words synonymously for the word of God. And so every time you see these words, precepts, testimonies, verse 80, statutes, your word, verse 81, your promise, verse 82, he keeps going back to the word of God. Your statutes, verse 83. Your law, verse 85. Your commandments, verse 86. Your precepts, verse 87. Your testimonies, verse 88. David is talking how the word of God intersects him in his life at every turn and every situation. And in verse 73 through 80, you're seeing that David is writing and he's saying, God is faithful in my affliction. He's faithful. Look at verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. You know what he's saying? He's saying that my sin has taken its course and you're still remaining faithful. C.S. Lewis said this, when sin entered the world, the world was bent. And that means no matter what, we can't go straight because we're sinners. We're sinful people. And we, our default position is to sin. I remember when my kids were little, I didn't have to teach them to hit. I didn't have to teach them to lie. It comes very natural to them. I didn't have to teach them these things because our natural bent is for sin, which is contrary to the way God created us in the garden. But when sin entered the world, everything was bent. It's like my son, his car. The alignment was off, and he didn't even recognize it. And if you don't rotate your tires and fix the alignment, then what's going to happen is you're going to have one tire that's going to be absolutely bald on one side. And he didn't know it. That's sin. When your alignment is off, you're always going to be pulling towards the things away from God. And the only way that you can get your alignment straight is through the Word of God and submitting to the Word of God in your life. That's what, the, that's what David is saying here. That God is faithful in our affliction. He's faithfulness. And that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me. According to your promise... Do you see it over and over again? Your word, your promise, your rules. Look at verse 37. For your mercy come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. So in the midst of his affliction, he's saying your law is my delight. Is that what we say in our affliction? No. No. We say things like, man, God, deliver me from my affliction. And if you don't, then I'm going to pray a little less. I'm going to live a little different. See, our response to affliction, David is saying here, is to trust, is to hope, and to pray for comfort, not deliverance. Big difference. Why? Because God is with us in our affliction. 
And we learn more about God in our affliction than we do in our non-afflicted times. That's hard. The Bible says in Psalm 27 that God is near to those who have a broken heart. And he saves those who have a crushed spirit. You are never closer to God than when you're afflicted. Hear me, church. I remember talking to a pastor in China. He was from China, and we're having this conversation, and he said, don't pray that our affliction stops. Pray that we are strong enough to endure it. So our response is to trust in the Lord, to hope in the Lord, to pray for comfort, to have verses in which we're standing on when we have nothing else to stand on. Think about the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. What did he say? He said, I went to the Lord three times to deliver me from an affliction. Now we don't know what it was. Was it a sin, a habitual sin? Was it, was it a, a physical ailment? The Bible doesn't tell us, but he says, I went to God three times. And what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your deliverance. No, 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 no. In your weakness. David's saying the same thing. He's saying, I'm being afflicted, but your law is my delight, Lord. Think about Jesus in the garden. He was afflicted. He was about to go to the cross. And what did he say? God, if it's possible, please let this cup pass before me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He was afflicted. He wasn't praying for deliverance. Now, do I think we should pray for deliverance? Yes. But we shouldn't be disappointed when we don't get it. Because let me share with you, God is nearer when we're afflicted. God is conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So often we're praying for that miracle. God, give me that miracle. Give me that miracle. And we're missing out of the God of the miracle. Because we so want that miracle. We so want that answer. Give me that answer, God. And we don't realize that God is right there. My son, he's weeping, he's crying, blood everywhere. We're in the emergency room trying to figure it out. They take the x-ray. Yep. I wanted to take it. I wanted to take the broken nose if I could have taken it from him. And I said, son, I'm so sorry. And he said, it's okay. I'm just glad you're here. Until we get to the point as a little child that we're just glad God is there and that God sees us and that God is with us and that we're not alone and isolated, I don't think we're going to understand what's going on in our life because we are afflicted. And, And let me show you something. When God is with us, it helps us feel less alone and we have each other also to help each other feel less alone. So if there's a sin or there's something in your life that you're afflicted by, talk about it. Share it. This is afflicting me. Help me. I feel alone. I feel like I'm drowning. What's the word of God say about this? This is what I need. You need God in that moment, not deliverance from your affliction. You need God's word. I remember my daughter. She plays field hockey and they lost in this game and she was so upset. And I said, did you cry? And she said, I wanted to, but I just started quoting the 23rd Psalm over and over and over again. 
And you know what happened? It changed me, Dad. I can't explain it, but it changed me. And I realized what was important, and that was God that was with me, even though I lost. God is faithful in our affliction. Verse 78, will we meditate on his precepts? Meditating on a, on, on a verse when you're not getting the answer that you want is very, very, very difficult. But it doesn't make it any less true. Encourage yourself with the word. Titus 1-2 says, in hopes of eternal life, which God promised, who cannot lie? God doesn't lie. So if you're standing on the word of God, it just hasn't happened yet. I remember, you know why this is so hard for me to preach? Because my dad just, I just buried my dad in August. And I miss him every day. And there are times that I'm so afflicted. And I just said, God, I prayed and prayed and prayed that you would heal him, and you didn't heal him. And people are like, well, yeah, he healed him in heaven. Yeah, I get it. But selfishly, I want him here. Selfishly, I talk to him every, I mean, I talk to him all the time. He, I felt like he was my connection to the family, that he got me and I got him. And I don't know if you've ever lost a parent, but like this is where I am right now. Just fresh. Woo, yay. And some of you are afflicted because maybe there's something going on, like you've had been divorced or you've prayed for something and it, it, God let you down because God didn't answer the prayer. Or you feel like God didn't answer the prayer. And I stood on the word of God and I'm standing on the word of God. He gets sick in February. I bury him in August. And here was the thing. Here was the beauty. As I'm putting my dad in front of the coffin, we're putting him in the ground. And here was the beauty. And here was the questions that came through my head. Is God any less good? Is God any less glorious? Is God any less loving than right now? Is God any less present? In fact, he was more present because his grace was there. Is God any less? The answer, church, is no. That his promises were true before my dad died, and they're still true after I bury him. And so I could have cling to it. So we cling to the truth of God's word in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our affliction. Secondly, verses 81 through 88. God is just in our persecution. This one's hard. God is just in our persecution. David is writing to his son and he's basically saying, God is just even though those around you are not. Look at verse 84. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? Why is God just in our persecution? Because verse 86, because God is sure in his commandments, his commands, that we can stand upon the promises of God's word, that they are true, and that the persecutions of this life ultimately will be for our benefit. How do we know this? Because he is strengthening us in our persecution. 
114-page book every Christian should read. It's called Tortured for Christ by a guy named Richard Wormbrandt. Some of you maybe know who he is. Some of you don't. If not, get the book. I promise it will change your life. He was a pastor. He was in love with Jesus, and he, they were thrown into a communist prison. He's written many books, but one of the books he wrote is The Evil of Communism and Marxism and Socialism. He writes about this and how it's contrary to the church and what Christ wanted. But he spent 16 years in solitary confinement. He came out and he wrote this book. And this is what he said. He said, God was never more near to me in my solitary confinement. He said, so often, the people that I was suffering in prison with, because he was 16 years in, in solitary confinement, but over 20 in prison, they would say things like, where's God in this hellhole? And he said, God was there and with me. And he said, it'll be easy for me to recognize him when I get to heaven. In the midst of your persecution, church, in the midst of your suffering, you're not only closer to God, but you get to know him and you'll be able to identify him far easier when we walk on the other side of glory. Get to know him now. Get to know him through his word. Read the word of God. Let it penetrate your soul. Let it comfort you in your persecution and affliction. Recognizes that God is strengthening us. And that's what he says. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. What are you hoping for, church? Our response here is to pray to wait, and to stay faithful. Pray, wait, and stay faithful. Why? Why can we do this? Because we know that God's word is true and it will come to pass. How do we know that? Because Jesus bodily rose from the dead and he said it. We can take it all back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do we know that God's word is true? I don't go to creation. I don't go to some other things. I go to the fact that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Everybody talked about how great he was. And he bodily rose from the dead. And he said the word of God is true. And he says that it should change my life. And it says that it's the way that I'm supposed to live. And if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you ought to believe in the changing power of the Word of God to wash over you in whatever you're going through, whether it's affliction, whether it's persecution, no matter what it is. But our response, according to David here, is to pray, to wait, to be faithful. How long? They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. I'm almost dead, God, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Despite our circumstances, God is faithful and just. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what we do to ourselves and what others do to us. He is just. We know how it ends, church. Who cares about Tuesday? I think we should all vote. But everyone's all freaking out. This is the end of democracy. This is the end of this is the end of world as we know it. Okay, I'm old, but I'm not that old, but they say that every election. Nothing changes. Because our hope, church, isn't in who's in the White House. 
Our hope is in the fact that in Revelation 19, there is a God-man, Jesus Christ, who's going to return on a white horse, and he's going to make every wrong right. He is just. He is coming again. And that's where our hope is. And so it doesn't matter who's elected. I still want it to rain, though. That way nobody can go crazy. You guys know the War of 1812? This is totally free. In the War of 1812, the British came and they were burning the White House. And they, they burned the White House and they started to burn Washington, D.C. But did you know that there was a hurricane that came that night and drove the British out of Washington, D.C.? And the rains came and put out all the fires so that Washington wasn't destroyed? When's the last time there was a hurricane in Washington, D.C.? 1812. Pray for rain Tuesday, church. Until then, we just wait. We recognize that he is good. Here's how I know this. Jesus was on the cross. He was afflicted and he was persecuted by unjust people. But he quoted the scripture as he's on the cross. And God was near to him. He was right there with him. Everyone said, oh, God forsook him. No, I don't believe that God forsake him. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's calling out to Psalm. Read Psalm 22. That's what he's quoting And at the end of the psalm, it says that God is so near to him. I think he was thinking over and over again. The scripture. This is my daughter. If you're a lost, she's quoting Psalm 23. I remember there was a season in my life where I was so disappointed because I had prayed so hard for things, for something to work out. And I remember that there was this season that I could just for my devotions, all I did was just read Psalm 23 over and over again. Every day, I just go back to Psalm 23. I just couldn't get past it because it's what I needed in that moment. God's Word is there for you right in that moment for whatever you need. Not to run from it, but to run to it. Because He'll strengthen us in the midst of persecution. Here we go. I'm out of time. We must hope and trust in the character of our God, regardless of the circumstances. We must hope and trust in the character of our God, regardless of our circumstances. The affliction may never end, the persecution may never stop, but God's word is true. And remember, it's only the first hundred years of life that are hard, right? We got eternity, eternal life. With Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer, church, that you know him, that you know him in your suffering. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Paul understood the only way that he could know Christ was to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Church, that's exciting. If you're suffering and afflicted right now, God is never more near to you. Stop running from him and start running to him. Recognize you don't even have to run that far. Just recognize he's there. He's the one holding you. Why do we look at this persecution and affliction and think, man, God just doesn't care? Let me tell you something, man. I I prayed for God to heal my dad so hard. Fasted, prayed. February comes, March, April, May, June, July, August. We buried him. You would look and think, God didn't answer that prayer. Yeah. You know what? I got something far better. I got his grace. My dad got to be with Jesus And I got to see and know Christ in the midst of my suffering and to experience the power of his resurrection. And it's my prayer that if you're here today and you're afflicted 
and you're asking the question this morning, does God really care? The answer is a, pre, is a resounding yes. 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 Yes, He cares and He loves you. But He's allowing this affliction, He's allowing this persecution to conform you to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, to strengthen you. So that when you walk into eternity, you will know Him in ways that you've never known Him before. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Verse 88 of Psalm 119 says, In your steadfast love give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. In your steadfast love give me life. Lord, I... I did not want to preach this, and you know it. It's so hard. I miss my dad every day, God. You know it. But God, your word is good and it's true. And it brings me comfort. I just thank you. Because you're a good God. Even in the midst of my suffering. And God, I pray that you'd be a good God to all those people people out here, Father, that are suffering. God, I pray that they would, they would just come forward. They would pray with somebody, Lord God, underneath the screens so that they don't feel alone. But they recognize that you're there and that there's other brothers and sisters in Christ that are there. God, we love you. You are a good God. You are faithful to the end. And we thank you, Father. We thank you that you've secured this because, Jesus, you are God. You died on the cross for our sins and you bodily rose from the dead. And, Jesus, you said it, that it's true. So we stand on the promises of your word, God, right now. We love you and thank you. So, Jesus, name we pray. Amen.